everyone, this is Chris Grasso with the Healing Journey Web Series presented by Toivo by Advocacy Unlimited. My guest today is David Verselli. David, thank you, first of all, so much for being on the show. I'm so excited to chat with you today. Thanks a lot for the invitation. I appreciate it. Yeah. So I, I just want to read your bio quickly before we get into this conversation that's going to cover a lot of really interesting and exciting topics to familiarize our audience with you a bit more. Um, David is an international expert in the areas of trauma intervention and conflict resolution. He is the creator of Tension and Trauma Releasing Exercises, or TRE. This revolutionary technique is designed to help release the deep tension created in the body during a traumatic experience or through chronic stress. He is also the... I'm sorry, he is also the energetic and creative founder and CEO of Trauma Recovery Services. Dave has spent two decades living and working in nine countries, providing trauma relief workshops and designing recovery programs for international organizations around the world. He has lived and worked extensively in Israel, Palestine, Sudan, Uganda, Kenya, Yemen, Egypt, and Lebanon. He is fluent in English and Arabic. David is unique and that he holds a solid academic and experiential grounding in psychotherapy and therapeutic bodywork. He integrates that with a keen understanding of the intertwining dynamics of religion and ethnic customs. This combination has allowed him to develop unique and specific processes that enable people from all parts of the world to manage and move beyond personal trauma, as well as bring healing and reconciliation between diverse groups. Again, David, thank you so much for being on the show today. Great. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So there is a lot of ground that I want to cover with you today. Um, we're going to be talking about these uh, exercises later on in the interview or the process, at least, that you've created. What I want to say right up front, and I will probably reiterate then and let the audience know, is that David and I first connected a little over a month ago, and um, I have his book and, and a DVD that walks you through these exercises and talks about David and his experience in trauma. And I told him that I wanted to wait at least a month or so before we did this interview. So I had time to really work with these exercises so I could come from a place of experience. And I can tell you, and I just do want to say this right up front, it's incredible what you have uh, brought to this world. I have had some really profound experiences myself with it. And I, those who know me know I don't advocate or you know, uh, endorse things lightly. So this is uh, very exciting for me to talk to you and share your work with the audience. Yeah, I'm really glad that you did it because the interviews are always so much better when somebody has an experience <laughs> from which sure. to speak. So thanks for doing them. Yeah, well, thank you for uh, taking the time. David and I connected about a month ago. He actually walked me through the exercises. It was a really wonderful experience. So let's start out, David, with going back. And I've watched a number of your interviews myself, and I know you talk about this, but I, I find it so important um, because this is, in a way, what led you to these exercises. So let's talk about how you spent much of your career in war zones. And like I already mentioned, you know, Lebanon and Palestine, the West Bank, etc. And this led you to an important observation you made about yourself and your coworkers, um, which, again, is largely responsible for this work and these exercises. Do you mind sharing a bit about that? No, I'll, I'll share it briefly. Yeah. Um, I was working with a nonprofit organization and we were doing work for war refugees. So that caused me to live in the country, experience both war myself and observe us, the population that were being traumatized by this particular type of violence. And there were many examples of when after a bombing or a shooting or sitting in a bomb shelter or something, that people would tremor out of what I believe to be nervous fear and anxiety. And I also experienced that shaking myself, which many people experience in life, even you know, if you have a car accident or something and you get out and you're not injured, but your, your hands are shaking or your knees are shaking. We have those phrases in our, in our language, actually. We laugh about it and joke about it. But I began to see patterns because I was living long term in these environments where the shaking actually manifested itself at very specific times. 
So it was either during the traumatic event or shortly after the traumatic event, people would begin to tremor. And <clears throat> the only difference for me was after a while, I began to ask, is this tremor mechanism having some type of potential therapeutic value mm. for us rather than is it the nervous system gone awry, which is what my uh, training had been kind of unconsciously. If you shake, calm it down, stop the person, they're on the verge of a nervous breakdown or whatever. And I discovered the exact opposite is true. People tremor or let's say the nervous system activates its own shaking mechanism deliberately when the nervous system is elevated too high. So those were during those traumatic events. People would become highly anxious and nervous. The nervous system highly stimulated itself and the nervous system's own way of reducing that stimulation is literally to tremor physically the organism or the human body. Mm -hmm. And that helps calm itself down. Yeah. You know, I, I prior to your work, I, I actually stumbled on your work by um, way of introduction from another trauma expert, Peter Levine, another mm -hmm. great writer and, and um, expert in this field. And he shared a story about how he was hit by a car. And, uh, and as a result of that, um, you know, he ended up in an ambulance. It was a very bad accident. But when he came to in the ambulance, one of the first things he asked was, or he noticed, not asked, but that his body was shaking, which he said was good. And, and it's counterintuitive to what we know. But when we get locked in that place, that's what locks the trauma into our body. Um, so that's uh, what I, I wanted to talk to you next about is, can you talk about what trauma is? What causes it? What? Well, it, that's a broad term. Right. And so you could look at it in a couple of different ways, but I'll tell you my way of looking at it. Sure. Trauma is any experience that essentially starts to overwhelm the individual. Mm -hmm. So you and I could both have exactly the same experience. Let's say if we were in a car accident, identical car accident, neither of us were hurt, but one of us could have nightmares about it, which means that was overwhelming. And the other one just gets over and says, well, it was a car accident. Mm -hmm. So if something overwhelms you or overstimulates you to the point that it stays activated after the event, then that would be considered traumatizing. Mm -hmm. Now, that's in a um, continuum kind of because you could have a stressful event, as an example, at work all week long, your boss is angry or there's discord among the employees. And you go home during the weekend and you're still angry and still upset and you can't sleep well because you're agitated. Now that's a prolonged stressful event. But if that continued for two or three months, then you could consider that you're moving up that continuum towards what's considered trauma or a post-trauma response. Mm. So, and I appreciate how you break that down in your book because a lot of people do have this misperception that trauma is strictly from these big events like a car accident or, you know, a natural disaster, terrorist attack, et cetera. And those, of course, are traumatic events, but they can also be smaller things as well. Oh, very much so. Yeah. We have, I think, what I call innocent traumas mm -hmm. in all of life, falling off a ladder, sure. um, minor car accidents, even something like a divorce. For some people, it can be stressful. Mm -hmm. For other people, it can be traumatizing. For some children, it could be stressful, and for other children, traumatizing. And so I think that trauma is a natural part of life. We don't like the word, and we try hard to think that I haven't been traumatized. But if you've been stressed out over a long period of time, you most likely have some type of what would be clinically assessed as post-trauma symptoms. Mm, right. And so how do we carry this trauma in our bodies? And how does the body cope with that? Well, think of it like this. I try to describe any experience in life uh, as a result of, a, of it affecting the human organism. Mm -hmm. Because if I use organism, I avoid that distinction between mind and body. Mm -hmm. Because inside the human organism, there is no such thing as separation. Whatever affects the brain neurologically affects the body physiologically and vice versa, what affects the body physically, physiologically 
has some effect neurologically. So if you think of the human organism, because we, we've distorted brain-body, and trying to use brain-body together still doesn't help us pull them together. So literally, if you have some type of experience, whether it's physical, psychological, or emotional, both brain and body, the neurophysiology, will both have some residual effect of defense, okay? The body's defense, literally, is to squeeze its muscle, squeeze the diaphragm, restrict the breathing. It basically pulls us together to survive what the threat is, whether it's perceived or real. And then the brain, the neurology, operates in a completely different way where it begins to activate instinct responses rather than logical responses, right. which is how you jump out of the, the, the way of a, running, uh, of a car that's going to hit you, or why you become overreactive to, why don't you stop saying that? What's wrong with you? Those overreactive things are neurological instinctual responses, not directly guided under conscious control. Right. So the body acts both on instinct neurologically and physiologically squeezes itself. The combination of that neurophysiological response helps us survive the event. And then after the event is over, we're supposed to let it all go and go back to normal. <laughs> right. Now, as you're saying that, if now if my understanding is correct, another way we could say that is because we have these three brains and right. that in impulsive is our oldest, our most primitive reptilian mm -hmm. brain. And that is significantly more powerful than the neocortex, the thinking portion of our brain, if I'm not mistaken. Right. That's exactly right. If your listeners understand the triune brain, right. the most primitive part of that would be the, the brain stem. And that deliberately overtakes the cortex Right. purposely so you will stop using logic and you will use instinct because the body's perceiving or the brain is perceiving this is a threat i can't use logic i better have an instinct response right so i can jump or run or kick or scream or have a a, a knee jerk what we call knee jerk reaction mm. to protect myself then when it's over i can logically think it all through Right. And so that's a way then we could say, I guess, the brain is processing our trauma. It it goes back into this primitive yet survivalistic instinct. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, survival mode. Sure. And the post-traumatic stress disorder is nothing more than the brain is still acting in survival mode mm -hmm. when the traumatic event is over and they no longer need it. That's our problem. And it's really in many ways not psychological or certainly not just psychological it's actually neurological mm. and so we have to return the neurological functioning back to its proper order and the post trauma symptoms will then reduce mm. or be eliminated be eliminated yeah. sure <laughs> So this segues, I think, into something that a lot of my own work centers around. And I work with people. Uh, I'm, I'm in recovery myself from drugs and alcohol. I work with a lot of people in recovery, but not just to drugs and alcohol. They have, you know, many different kinds of addictions, whether it's sexual or eating or, you know, they struggle with depression, things of that nature. But I, I would love for you if you could talk about the relationship between trauma and addiction. Well, addiction generally tends to be a way to try to downregulate or control an overexcited nervous system and a dysregulated neural thinking reactivity, as an example, from the brainstem. Right. So addictions generally result as a way of trying to reduce that and bring it back to normal. So people will use either a substance or a behavior. Right. And so what happens is neither of those, neither the substance nor the behavior, will help restore the order in the neurophysiology. It just keeps swinging the person back and forth, and that's how they get stuck in it. They never end up going back to the baseline, which is in the middle. Right. So what I find interesting uh, is a lot of people, and again, not just with drugs or alcohol, but 
even people that say on a spiritual path, you know, they've, they've, or they've been in recovery for many years, they've, or they've been on a spiritual path, meditating, you know, and, and live for all intents and purposes, a healthy lifestyle. But then some overwhelming things start to come up in their lives and they go back to whatever self-defeating behaviors it is, whether it's a relapse or it's a return to whatever. What's the relationship there with trauma? Well, the relationship is that when trauma is highly activating and you start to feel anxious and nervous and out of control, yeah. the, the neurophysiology will always go back to something in its history. Well, this helped me survive it then. Mm. I'm going to use it again now. And so then it reactivates that behavior pattern, either through the substance or some type of acting out behavior, because it saved me before or it's what I used before. Right. And... So I'm going to try it again. So it doesn't generally look for a new behavior or a new substance. It really looks for what saved it before. Yeah. And so if once your nervous system starts to re-elevate, let's say in the future, two years from now, and you start to get anxious and nervous, your brain and body are going to say, wait, 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 I know what to do here to help slow this down a little bit. If you do not have some other substance or some other behavior in place to actually modify that behavior or modify the substance. And what I mean by that is if you have a healthy diet and you have a healthy regimen of exercise, as an example, the body will choose the healthy alternative. But if there is no healthy alternative available, it will choose the only one that it has. Mm. See, and so that's how you can actually come out of post-trauma symptoms. That's how many soldiers are doing it. They're actually taking these um, uh, behaviors or substances they used in the beginning when they were coming back to the United States, and they're introducing new behaviors and new substances like healthy foods, mm -hmm. and now their body's choosing that one. Mm -hmm. And that's how they're getting through their post-trauma symptoms. Excellent. Okay. So there's a chapter... In the in uh, in your book, the revolutionary trauma healing process, a book I, I loved and I cannot recommend enough to our audience. Um, and you talk about the body's wisdom and how it takes more than just traditional counseling to heal trauma. And so, as we start to move a bit more into, we're going to talk about the the TRE process. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? How you know, it's not that it's saying it's negating counseling altogether, at least from what I understood, but it's saying that it, it needs more than just that. And I think that goes back to how our bodies are holding this trauma within. Yeah, in the development of therapy, if you will, we've moved back and forth between body work and psychology or counseling. And that sort of followed our rhythm of separating the brain and the body. But with the advent of new neural research because neurology is different from psychology right. neurology is just neurology is nerves and neurons and electrical stimulation psychology is how we interpret that mm. okay but neurology and physiology and the advancement in the research of those fields is now demonstrating that people actually do bring back in their bodies some type of chronic tension pattern that was created at the time of the stressful or traumatic event that the organism is holding on to. Now, the person may think they've gotten rid of it, but what will happen is they simply develop a new pattern around that protective mechanism, and then two or three years down the road, they start having chronic pain or secondary or tertiary illnesses as a result of chronic pain or neurophysiological dysfunction. Mm. And so what's happening is we're realizing that post-traumatic stress disorder includes a lot more than just psychology. Some people need to tell the story yeah. initially. Some people don't want to tell the story and want to do just body work. Some people don't want to do body work or tell the story and they want to talk about their spirituality. How did it change their relationship with their God or whatever? But what I've discovered is that ultimately through the healing process, every human being, even atheists and agnostics, go through the process of trying to reconnect all three of those parts of being human. Mm -hmm. My psyche or emotions, 
my physiology or my body, as well as my belief system, if you will. Even if the belief system is agnosticism or atheism, many people after traumatic events will either move towards believing in God because they feel God's helped them survive the event, sure. or move away from God because they feel God abandoned them. But either way, there's still something about a belief system that the human person seems to have that is also altered with the neurology, psychology, and physiology of that experience. Mm. Very well said. <laughs> so it, it actually kind of, that another nice segue, another part of your book, another one of the chapters is Healing Our Divisions. And you talk about, and I, I really, really love this part, reconnecting what you called our alienated parties. You know, is that something you could you'd talk about? Right. The sexual abuse would probably be the easiest one to understand. Sure. During sexual abuse, it's terribly emotionally distressful, psychologically disturbing, but it's also physically challenging to the organism. It's a threat. And so what happens is not just the emotion and the psyche are altered by this, but literally the, the pelvis squeezes an entire series of muscles so tightly that even years later, people will feel either numb or pain or what they call freezing, like they feel frozen in the pelvic area. Mm. Now, that's interesting to us physiologically. How does the body produce a sensation of numbness or freezing or some type of dissociated state there or painful condition? And so that's a perfect example of that stays inside the structure. And so then the structure gets segmented. Their, their chest and their breathing could be alive. Their face could be alive. They could even appear to be happy, but now the body is segmented mm. so that when they start to do some of their trauma healing work, as an example, all of a sudden the pelvis starts to come back alive. It starts to come out, thaw from its numbness or its frozenness. It starts to have feeling, and then the person starts to feel terror. Mm. Whereas they've been living their life for 10 years after the abuse, thinking they had gotten over it. So the body can literally segment itself in terms of sensation, movement, um, neural stimulation to the brain. When, when you have chronic pain, oftentimes you don't even know it's there or you don't know what its origin is. You say, I don't know why, but my neck is always hurting, but I don't know what that's coming from. Well, there is an origin, see, but you've completely forgotten that. But if we start to work with your neck, that history may resurface in your memory. Mm. See, So the body can segment very well as a form of survival. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so let's talk about, well, I'm sorry, before you have the exercises, one more thing, and then we're going to jump into the, the actual Terry process, talk about that. But one final uh, element you talk about in the book, and for the audience, this is barely scratching the surface of everything you cover in the book. It's very, uh, very comprehensive. Um, but you do talk a bit about making sense of trauma and traumatic times and looking at our trauma as a teacher. So I'd love if you would elaborate a little bit on how we can do that. Well, there's a lot of research that's coming out now that's called post-traumatic growth. And it actually came out of experiences of clinicians helping uh, trauma survivors through their trauma. We weren't searching for it. It just surfaced mm -hmm. as a repeated pattern. And here's what it would be like. People will often say, I never wanted that to happen. But since it has, it has changed my life. Mm -hmm. And this type of research is demonstrating that people after traumatic events often return not just back to normal, but actually better in some ways than they were before the traumatic event. And some people see complete changes in their life. Mm. So now that again strikes curiosity to us. Not that we should be traumatized to change life. I don't believe that's true. Sure. But it's an inevitability sometimes for us in life. And then the question becomes, what do you do once the experience has happened, once you've had a traumatic event in your life, 
you can't change it, so you can't go backwards. The question is, what do you do with that? And a lot of people are beginning to use that as some type of learning about my potential of humanness, our resiliency as humans, not just to recover, but resiliency to even grow and become better. I'm watching the Invictus Games right now on TV, which are all the veterans from around the world right. who, are, who have some type of um, physical or psychological, psycho-emotional li limitation or, or illness, and they're competing. And the stories they're telling us with tremendous trauma, mm. saying, I love my children more. I, my marriage is wonderful. I've embraced life deeper. I realize I'm not just a person <coughs> who lost a leg. I'm still an alive human being. Yeah. And so what if I don't have a leg? I would like to have it back, but it doesn't limit my humanness. Right. And that's what we're discovering, that we somehow as humans have the potential to truly take those experiences in life and actually do something with them that restores um, a, the sense of coming back to life and even coming back to life and embracing it in a deeper way than we did before the event. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, I know I'm not unique in that story, but I share that story with many others. I look at my own life and some of the very low places I've been, but they always, and I, and I feel grateful for this because it's not the case with everyone I know, but they've become the catalyst for me to grow and to go above and beyond where I was previously in life. And I've known many other people as well that have taken their hardships and really done some amazing things as a result of them. Well, what I've seen, because I've lived in many countries and traveled through many countries around the world and gone to many natural disasters like earthquakes and typhoons and tornadoes and all kinds of things. Yeah. And all over the world, human beings are doing this despite culture, language, their psychological background, anything. Somehow it is embedded in the human spirit mm -hmm. to come back to life and to go through the pain of obviously the recovery, but even to come back to life stronger and better. So it seems to be the nature of our humanness. Mm -hmm. And I think that deserves a great deal of exploration um, and affirmation as to how do we do this, why do we do it, and what's the value that we might all be contributing to sort of the evolution of humanity through these traumatic experiences. Mm, beautifully said. In my case, I know part of um, my own stuckness, we will call it, is that I was working with a lot of spiritual practices, as I still do, but I was not incorporating any kind of real trauma healing or any kind of body work, let's say. And that's why I'm so fond of this TRE practice that you teach all over the world. Um, now, the actual, I'll, I'll let the audience know, the actual steps, it's beyond the scope of what we can cover, the specifics in this, um, because there's there are a lot of subtleties, there's a number of movements and, and so on and so forth. So I would recommend, and this isn't a sales pitch, it's just legitimate, like you really do need to look at either the book or the DVD or both like I did to learn them. Um, or there are workshops as well, I believe, all throughout the world. But I would love to talk about this TRE process. What is it? Why is it so effective? Who is it for? I mean, I have tons of questions. So let's start with what is it? Okay. So when I observed this shaking or tremoring that human beings had um, during or shortly after traumatic events, and I began to suspect that this might be normal to the human body, mm meaning it's part of our neurophysiology that's genetically encoded in us. So my assumption is if it's genetically encoded, there must be a way to access that. And my challenge was, while I was living in these violent situations, was how can I get all human beings to access this without needing therapeutic direction or guidance? Because in places like Sudan, that simply does not exist. Right. So there must be a way the human organism can recover without needing professionalism to do it. We, we are capable of recovering just by being human. So I discovered that if I could put together a series of exercises that do two things, they mildly stress the muscles, simply mildly stress them, 
and then stretch the muscles to kind of pull out the contracted state and, and that mild stressor challenges it, the muscle actually begins to tremor quite easily. No different than if you're trying to lift weights that are a little bit too hard for you and you can feel your biceps starting to shake. Or in school, in gym classes, they have you lean against the wall in a sitting position and you can feel your legs starting to shake. Right. Well, what I did was I actually reduced uh, the amount of stressor in that so that once the shaking activates, you take the stressor off the muscle and then you lay down on the floor, which is the last exercise, and the muscle begins to tremor naturally. Mm -hmm. It has no more stressor any longer because it's the tremor mechanism that now got activated. So now there's a whole neurophysiological feedback loop that's occurred. Once the tremor mechanism is activated because it's genetically encoded in you, you literally could lay on the floor, watch TV, read a book, listen to music. It won't matter because we're going to go back to the triune brain. It's the primitive part of the brain, the brain stem, out of which this tremor mechanism is evoked. So you could use your conscious brain to talk while the brain stem is doing something entirely different in this feedback loop. And what appears to be happening, and we're continuing to research, is that the shaking mechanism itself is doing two things. It is both reducing the tightness in the various muscle groups where, that were contracted during the time of the stressor, and it's reducing the high excited charge of the nervous system. So it seems to be both calming the person down neurologically and reducing the tension in the body physiologically. Mm -hmm. So I remember before I started working with the practice, I had looked up your website and there's plenty of wonderful videos on there that I recommend uh, people check out and we'll have your website linked for everyone that, that is uh, watching this or listening to this. And so there's no way to get around it. It looks a little weird. It, it just, it is what it is. It looks a little weird. I remember I laughed in one of your videos. You playfully said to, you were working with maybe about a dozen or so people. You're like, look, it's going to look weird, get over it, you know, and, and, and they did, and it's great. And so I remember watching it thinking, all right, well, you know, I'm a pretty open-minded person. And so, like I said in the beginning of this conversation, about a month ago or so, you and I were, we Skyped, and you helped walk me through the process. And sure enough, it it was not a conscious thing that it was happening for me. You know, there was, the, the, the mechanism started, the tremor started, it's not, it, it's such, it's hard to describe. It's not painful at all. You know, it's just your body naturally shaking. If anything, it's soothing and relaxing, I find in my own experience. My sleep has certainly gotten much better since I've been doing this. And the cool thing that I like too, which you already mentioned, is you can be doing, so, not doing, but like watching something, even reading a book if you want, listening to an audio book. And I found in my case that helped because after we spoke, the next time I did it on my own, I was thinking about it and I think I started getting in my own way. So, you know, you'd said, sure, you talked about some, I think, police officers or maybe army soldiers you'd worked with and you told them, just turn the TV on, watch a baseball game or whatever. So I put a show on and that helped me like get out of my own head and just let the body do what the body's going to do. Right. I like what you said. There are two things which are really delightful and playful because I encourage people to play with trauma healing as long as it's not something severe and difficult they right. need to deal with. Right. But there are many innocent traumas we've experienced in life that could be playfully uh, resolved. But what I like about it is when people first experience it, even neurologists, and I've taught many, and I've taught many soldiers, I explain to them what I'm going to do, I show them a PowerPoint, show them a video, and they'll look at me and say, there's no way that's going to happen to me. <laughs> Well, thank God it's, it's in, embedded in the neurophysiology of the human organism because I know 100% it will happen. Yeah. What's really funny is when it happens, it produces a paradoxical sort of experience in us. The ego says, wait, why am I not controlling the body? Right. This is really weird. And I should be controlling the body. And the body says, well, I'm really controlling it. But it's safe. And so now the dialogue goes back and forth between the ego and the body. Yep. And it's one of the few examples that we have in our physical experience where we actually learn that letting go of the body is safe and pleasurable. Because trauma and stress 
meant don't let go of the body because it's dangerous. And so we actually have to retrain the organism from letting go being equated with dangerous to letting go being equated both with pleasure and health, Mm -hmm. see? So the trauma survivor has to go through that process of saying, wait, letting go can be safe now, not only safe, essential for the healing or recovery process. Mm -hmm. But the playfulness with which you did it is what I love. And I get it all the time. I will have neurologists say, I have no idea what's going on. I don't know how you did it, what's happening. But again, it's the dialogue of the playfulness. And and I really like that. And the other thing is when you say, I distracted my brain. Well, that's exactly right because we're too comfortable and familiar with controlling ourselves. So the minute something goes out of control in our body, the cortex activates and says, wait, put it under control, put it under control. And you can inhibit it, like you're talking about. And that's when I say, well, then watch TV or read a book. So you, uh, you distract the cortex and then the brain stem is allowed to do what it needs to do. And so that's a very valuable dialogue, literally, to have within yourself to learn how to relive, if you will, back in your body in a healthy manner. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny because even with those distractions at times, I love that you bring up the ego mind because it will still creep back in. And, you know, well, why isn't this part of the body shaking as much as that? Or, you know, I want it to be shaking more, you know, it becomes a very ego thing. And then, you know, and you talk at length about this in both the DVD and the book, it's going to be different for everybody. Your body knows what needs to be released. It knows what it's doing. So just relax. Take it easy. What's really kind of funny is people don't tremor in one part and say, well, I want to tremor there. And other people (laughs) don't tremor in other parts. I want to tremor there. And quite frankly, the tremor mechanism, since it's part of physiology, can only follow the tissue pattern in the body. So it's not like it has some bright wisdom or something it's literally following your physiology meaning it's following the muscle and fascia patterns in the structure so when it can tremor higher up the body from the waist to the diaphragm as an example it will not because it's wise but because now the tissue is relaxed enough and the tremor mechanism can move there Mm. it's that simple so it has nothing to do with wisdom as much as it has to do with it just follows anatomy yeah right right and the other thing I, I like, I mean, there's plenty I like, but, I, you know, something I think you and I talked about the last time we spoke is, and you do write about this in your book, is that you don't need to consciously work through stuff. For some people, like you said earlier, yes, that's an important part of their process. So it's not to take away from that. But the beauty of this pr- process is that it can release things without you even consciously knowing what it's releasing. And then the other side of that is sometimes if it if the body needs you or wants you to know something, it will put these memories. The memories will come up, which also happened for me a couple of times. Memories I have not thought about at 10 plus years. And it's like, whoa, after I was done or while I'm doing it, where did that come from? You know, and well, I know where it came from, but it's amazing how it works. It's quite interesting. I love that you say it's amazing how it works. It's amazing how we work, which is really so fascinating. Because if you think of neurophysiology as we started our conversation, if the body is tremoring and it's releasing a contraction pattern, sometimes the contraction pattern that it's releasing is associated with the memory. Mm. Other times you may not have the memory at all. Sometimes it's associated with an emotion. So you might have the emotional release of anger or fear or sadness. You might cry. But it's almost like the body and brain are simply releasing all of it. It's nothing to grab onto and necessarily needs to be processed. I have a lot of clients who have done a great deal of psychotherapy in healing their traumas. So they've talked about it. They've had all the emotions about it, etc. And then their body will start to release the physical contraction of that trauma, Mm. (coughs) excuse me, and they'll say, I know what this is, but I don't need to process it anymore. I've already done that piece. So somehow, again, we have this capacity of separating and dividing ourselves up and healing various components. But the important piece about this tremor mechanism is it's demonstrating that the body must be addressed 
in the healing process, not just the psyche, not just the memory, not just the emotions. There is a physiology directly connected to any traumatic event, even if there was no physical abuse in the experience. Mm. One other thing I loved about it is, at, well, at the end of our call, and you kind of took me by surprise on this, uh, you'd asked me, so how do you feel physically right now? And I said to you, I don't have the words because it's an experience that I've never felt. I could say, you know, calmer, but that wouldn't quite, you know, uh, do justice to what I was feeling. And you said, isn't it interesting, you know, that we are so out of touch with our bodies as a species for the most part that we don't know how to put words to our experience. Yeah. And you're well, so right. It's quite interesting. I love learning more about the human organism or us as a human species. Quite fascinating. But literally, like you were talking earlier, we can deaden the neural stimulation coming from muscles into the brain. So we can actually segment the body where we don't feel different parts and all that sort of stuff. But once they re-stimulate back to life, we actually don't know how to express that sensory sensation because it's brand new to us again. Right. And sometimes it takes a little bit of time to realize, oh my God, the parts are now talking together or I'm moving more smoothly now or my left and right side seem to be more coordinated than in the past or the top or bottom. But it actually takes a little bit of time sometimes for us to re-stimulate the neural pathways and the sensory receptors so that we actually feel our wholeness mm -hmm. once again which we should be living in our whole life, but none of us really are. Right. But feeling our wholeness again is really quite an inter interesting sensation that we often don't know how to articulate. Absolutely, and that's what I love about this. Even though I might be watching something or listening to an audiobook or music as it's happening to help lay the ego self aside for that time, I find that over the course of this month, I have become more in tuned with my body. You know, there's the big mindfulness movement, but what about a bodyfulness movement as well, bringing the two together? And I'm so glad to, to be integrating those two because that was a big part that was lacking in my own process and my own practice. Yeah, what I find with mindfulness, although I love it dearly, is yeah. you could be very mindful of your body, but if you don't have sensory stimulation of it, mm. you don't even know you don't feel it. Right. And so, you know, I tell people, well, all right, well, be mindful of your breathing. Well, they are, but they have no idea that their breathing is desperately shallow. Mm. For them, it feels like a deep breath because that their diaphragm is so constricted. So I love mindfulness because it does try to get people in touch, but there has to be stimulation from the physiology of the organism up to the brain as well for that loop to be truly connected and now being able to pulsate better because, <coughs> I'm, excuse me, I'm trying to describe the human organism as a, simply a complex amoeba. It's always seeking to go back to its healthiest state after it's contracted in some way. Mm. That includes the neurology, physiology, and psycho-emotional state. And so we constantly have to address all of those if, the hu if we're directing the human organism towards health. Right. Now we have all these different modalities which can do that. But ultimately, the organism itself has to come back into one whole unity. Yeah. Well, like I said, I mean, until people try the practices, which I can't recommend enough, you know, by picking up the book, by, by picking up the DVD, I will have links to those as well. Um, you know, it's like the teacher that says, I can tell you what a peach tastes like all day long, but until you bite into it, you're not going to know. So I am so grateful that I've tasted the TRE practices, so to speak. And before we wrap this up, is there anything that I didn't cover that you would like to share with the audience? Because like I said, this is just scratching the, you know, the tip of the iceberg as far as what you're offering to people. Yeah. At the end of all discussions, I like to sort of embrace two different things. Yeah. I want to be encouraging to people and I also want to caution people. Yeah. And here's yeah. the point. Encouragement, meaning our human organism is designed to heal. 
And much of it, it can do by itself. And even the TRE practice can very often be done safely by following the book and DVD with no problem and people can have great benefit from it. The caution is, is that some people have, when they're accessing severe trauma and um, difficult experiences in their past, could have experiences of freezing, flooding, and dissociation. We won't go into what that is, but clinically those are protective neurological mechanisms that we applied and used to survive the traumatic event. When some, and many people can think they're over this, but when they start to stimulate their body again and the neural receptors are reactivated, they could re-experience what they experienced at the time of the traumatic event. And in those cases, those people clearly should go to a clinician or a TRE provider who's trained to do this and not think that they can do this alone. Mm -hmm. Because what they could do is just get caught recycling through the same traumatic experience. So encouragement that many of the traumas, innocent traumas in our lives, we can heal from. The caution is if you're going into something so deep that you're afraid or you can't feel you can control it comfortably yourself, please seek therapeutic guidance. Wonderfully said. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe you also make uh, that point very clearly stated in both the book and DVD. And I just mentioned that in case anyone's listened or watched this interview, and even if you don't think it might be useful for yourself, but someone you know and you want to gift them the book or DVD, you know, the, 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 the warnings are there. Not warnings, but the cautions are there. So, but right. thank you. Yeah, and the cautions are there simply because I know even in the most difficult of, of traumas that we've had, the organism still wants to heal. Right. And so when you're going through difficult traumas, you just have to help it go through that healing a little bit slower. Right. Whereas when they're less difficult and innocent traumas, like falling off a ladder and hurting your hip, but your body still needs to heal from it, well, that one you could go through much faster. Yeah. I kind of equate it to getting deep tissue massage. If, the, if you have really deep tension in your shoulder muscles, well, the massage therapist can only go so deep so long. Right. Um, and it has to take several sessions to heal that. If it's just mild tension in your shoulders, you can usually get it out through one traumatic session and you, don't, you might even be able to do it yourself at home. Right. Be respectful of the human body and of your experiences in life. That's always the bottom line. Perfect. Well, David, thank you so much for your time. It's a real pleasure. Uh, anyone that is interested in checking out David's work, the link to his website will be available, um, as well as to check out the book directly and the DVD. It'll all be listed right there. Um, David, again, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. That was great. I enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. Thank you.